Hello OPL fans and welcome to semi-final week. Four teams will enter, only two teams will leave. Hello everyone, I'm Jake Spawn Tiberian. Joining me on the desk for this great week will be Julian Petri Time Car as well as Indiana Frosco. Frosco? We'll go with Frosco, I like it better. The Australians Black. call me Frosco. Yeah, the Australian version of Frosco and I like it. But semi-finals week, P pumped to be here guys? Oh, absolutely. It's, you know, we just said Easter. I did say on Twitter it was my favorite holiday. I think I lied. I think playoffs is my favorite time of year. Wow, I can't even top that. How <laughs> cheap. No, I'm just super stoked. I'm always excited when I get to be on the desk, especially for hype matches like this. Great use of the word stoked, stoked. as well. I feel like, yeah, this is a simulation. This is good. But we will pull up the brackets for you guys to check out quickly. Tonight, it will be Legacy Esports taking on Diables as a first versus fourth seed, whilst tomorrow will be Chiefs versus Sin Gaming, as we actually just pull the schedule up on your screen so you can check it out for yourself. Of course, tonight, as I mentioned, it is going to be Legacy versus the Diables. It is number one versus number four, and you know, it should be on paper, the most mismatched, but I think it's actually a relatively close game. Whilst tomorrow night, it is going to be Chiefs versus Sin, two teams that storm home at the end of regular season. This is an exciting week. I Last year, it was so easy to kind of pick the two winners coming out of semifinals. Two teams entered in form so many of the times, but this time, four teams, it seems so much closer. Yeah, it just feels like the most competitive split we'd have, we've ever had. There was so many changes for the OP. I think best of threes have been huge for a lot of the teams in different ways. And I think now we have four really strong playoff teams. It just feels like, again, like most competitive split. Now playoffs looking very similar. The thing that I love is just stylistically how these teams match up. It's like the Chiefs versus Sin, kind of the two smart teams, if you will, and then Direwolves versus Legacy, the two <laughs> brute force teams. Yeah, it certainly is going to be interesting to see how the matchups do go. However, guys, during the week, we're going to be tracking you guys on social media using that hashtag IMOPL. To get the conversation started, however, we're going to throw it over to Matthew fish Stewart to check in. Thank you very much, Spawn. And as you can see behind me in just a second, currently 70% of you guys at home think that Legacy are going to take tonight's best of five series. If you guys want to show us who you think is going to win tonight, use the hashtags LGC win, hashtag DW win, and hashtag I am OPL because these will be updated real time. It'll be an accurate representation of what everybody at home thinks is going to be the outcome of tonight's match. As you can see on the screen as well, we already got a few fantastic tweets in and also... Legacy win is currently trending in Australia at number six. So all of you Die Wolves fans at home, get on your Twitter, tweet hashtag DWWin, support your teams, and we'll see you guys later. Thank you so much, Fitz. That's going to be very exciting to check in and see how the teams are going during the week. Can't believe that right now, number six on Twitter, that's absolutely massive. Feeding the hashtag IMOPL. Guys, get out What's there, this? show your support. That's massive. Yeah, use the other hashtag too. I like that hashtag. Get some sing wins in there. Who knows? Get some. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, I think we made the joke that if you want to disagree with anything that we say on the desk, desk, you can do it on Twitter as long as you use the hashtag. You use the hashtag, I'll respond to every single one. Well, there you go. You have Frost Grimm's personal guarantee. However, guys, there's also a way that you can watch the viewing parties from your local Hoyt Cinema. That is, of course, for the final coming up on April number five. As you can see, the viewing parties on your screens. Get involved. Get out there in force. Show your passion for the OPL. It's going to be great to get along to some of those viewing parties. You know, I went to some before I was a shoutcaster. There are lots of fun to get involved with things like that. However, guys, we do have a semi-final to get underway. So let's kick it off. It is going to be Legacy versus the Direwolves for game number one. It is number one versus number four. But two teams that were struggling later on in the season, we actually were able to catch up with Legacy last week. So let's check out and hear what they have to say. Yeah, no, I love land. There's nothing better than just killing someone, screaming, and knowing they heard you. They know, right? Like, you beat them and they know it. Oh, love it. I love seeing them walking around. I love seeing them sitting on the other end. I love just getting in their head. I love staring at them and just like figuring out what they're thinking. Like, you know, what are you planning to do today? Well, it's not gonna work, because I know what I'm doing and it's 10 times better. Uh, Regret played last year, split two semifinals in the studio and King also has played one studio final. Um, it's, it's not much. Inexperience could hurt them. Uh, I'm not entirely sure, to be honest. But that said, uh, I know no one on Diwolves has any experience in the land. I think, who is it? I think Fantix and Sharp are the only ones. I think Sipple's only ever played in one tournament, as far as I know. Uh, I think the bot lane might struggle with inexperience on a land. You know, nerves, nerves are definitely a big factor. But if I was a Diwolves, yeah, I'd be much more. I'd be much more worried about their players because uh, they got way less experience than we do. Diwolves really only have one strategy, one win strategy. And it's through their mid laner. It's fairly easy to to counterplay, like. It's really easy to read. You can see where they're investing their resources and you can easily counter it. A lot of matchups really come down to the jungle 
matchup, just who wins jung who wins jungling, pretty much their team will win the game. But I'm confident that Carbon has experience wise and just understanding game knowledge wise will definitely outclass Sybil. But I know that Sybil has some very cheeky pocket picks that he will probably reveal coming up to semis. You know, they're all very mechanically skilled players and if they get a gold lead, um, they can punish you really hard with it. Not necessarily in a macro sense, but you know, if they get ahead, you're probably not going to win another team fight for the rest of the game. So I think, yeah, I think if they're playing at their peak, definitely be a very close series. But again, I think it's more, it's more on us. You know, uh, if we play at our peak, I'm confident that, that there's no team we can't beat. Do I see us as the best team in the region? Not by a lot. Not by a lot. I think Sin, um, Sin Chiefs, and Legacy are very close. Very close. I'm pretty sure those series can go either way. At the moment, that's what I feel. I think within the next four days leading up to the semi-finals, we will definitely see which teams can focus and improve the most. And that's what I think will differentiate who wins the whole split and who doesn't. I mean, it'd be nice if Sin Wheat beat them. It'd be nice not to have to beat Chiefs in the final. <laughs> That'd be a welcome change. It just always seems to happen that way. You know, we've had 10 weeks of OPL and then we're going to have semi-finals. And at the end of the day, I'm going to be doing the same thing I do every year. <laughs> In the body chiefs. In the back of my mind, I know what the final is going to be. Um, you know, it, it's, it's this uh, kind of like destiny, I suppose. You know, uh, yeah, we're thinking about die wolves, uh, absolutely. But uh, in the back of my mind, you know, I know who I'm going to be playing against uh, in two weeks' time, and uh, I'm prepared. Carbon looking to book himself another date with Destiny. Said he's not looking past the Diables and actually a little bit more reserved than I think we've ever seen Legacy this split. I think there were some, definitely some cheeky shots in there, which is just what we expect from, honestly, the general and his tactician. That's what it felt like from Carbon and Choose for me. Carbon, he's giving orders, he's making sure he's got the plans, and Choose is like, you know what? I know how to execute this. I've got the plan. I know how to counter Fantix. It's just wonderful to see these two work. It's a partnership that's worked for so long. Yeah, it certainly is. And in, we're actually going to take you through the legacy lineup, guys. So let's take you through that right now. In the top lane, it is going to be Tally. That's the back of his head. Very nice back of the head, though. <laughs> MVP. <laughs> yeah, and a player that's looked honestly completely on fire since he rejoined the team. And I guess the top lane there as well. Tally, just every champion he picks up turns to gold, it feels like. There's nothing he can do wrong on any pick. And to me, that's kind of like the biggest mismatch going into these two lineups is kind of where the top laners are, Tally versus Sharp. Um, very swingy in either direction. Yeah, it certainly is. Carbon, the man on your jungle, the most improved, the shot caller captain, overall dad of legacy, and pretty great guy as well. You see Carbon, he's having a cheeky grin on the screen right now. What a split. Yeah, I mean, a player that's definitely driven by his emotions, but had an excellent split, especially given the overall performance of the team for, uh, from 2015. He's, you know, personally invested in the team more ways than one. Carbon always wants to show up. And of course, Choo Choo's their mid laner. Very impressive throughout as well. Probably the most underspoken member of the team, but has stepped up in massive ways. And it's crazy the fact that Choo Choo gets to be a highlighted member as a mid laner in the OPL, because right now it is such a stacked league of very potent and powerful mid laners, and Choo Choo's is right there. I think people forget, honestly, that Choo is a veteran, surprisingly, and it's going to show here. And on your screen right now, it is your boy, King. What an AD carry. He used to actually play for the team that they're going up against. Maybe a little bit more reserved, but still a very big playmaking AD carry. It's funny if his first name is apparently Calvin, which I didn't realize, but <laughs> your boy King, he's looked great all season long. He's going to be playing against his old teammates here, and as always, King wants to win. Yeah, it certainly is, and regret on your screen. Very good Alistair Braum, fresh player. He's got everything. He even plays a bard right now. I think that regret, once again, another underspoken, underrepresented member of the team, but their bottom lane really hasn't had to do that much. Yeah, obviously when you have the top side of the map pulling so much weight, but I do think that Regret and King have an incredibly high mechanical ceiling, and they've both shown in the past that they can go uh, full pedal to the metal. Yeah, they certainly have. All right, guys, so let's break this down. Legacy, they're a lineup. They finished first. They only dropped one game, was against the Chiefs. Their strengths across the wrist. Where are we looking for this game, for this team to get ahead? Top side of the map. Yeah. Definitely. It's going to be Carbon. Um, he's... I think he's the best jungler in the OPL. I don't think that there's much contestion there, although uh, he did say in the video that he certainly respects Sybil when he gets certain pocket picks. Um, and it's just him bouncing between Choose and Tally. I think, honestly, it's really been Tally that's been the story of a lot of Carbon's success as well. He loves to go top. He loves to snowball that lane ahead. Yes, Tally's a very good 1v1 player, and with gold especially, he just carries the game single-handedly. But Carbon has gotten the most ridiculous lane combinations ahead. I think they got Lissandra heading against an Olaf at one point in early on in the split. Like... 
No duo should be able to do that, that's but they consistently I, do that's it. That's what I want to talk about, because we've seen great carry junglers. We've seen the likes of Seb on Inferno and be able to get those early leads. Carbon very rarely takes them for himself. He either transitions it into Tally, transition it, transitions it into Choosers, then kind of just sits back and is like, all right, guys, I've done my job. Like, Take me to the promised land. They're actually two uh, fairly gank-heavy junglers, to be honest, which is sort of interesting. Like, I think Civil and Carbon, they like to get aggressive. They like to really, you know, shed some blood. I think they could meet each other all their lanes very quickly. Well, speaking of the Direwolves, guys, we actually got a chance to catch up with them and talk about what was a rocky end to their season and how they're feeling coming into the semi semi-finals. Here they are. We're really going to have to step up on land to beat Legacy. But I think we'll be more prepared than we ever have before. So the situation with our team is basically uh, our top laner, Sharp, wasn't, uh, he's been having like other commitments outside of League and he's been unable to play with us so we never really get to practice him throughout the day and when he does show up to scrims he can't scrim for as long as for, uh, the, the rest of our team. Since we lost to a few bottom tier teams we really just couldn't accept what was happening so we all sort of stepped up in our own way, we got an analyst who's sort of filling in as a bit of a coach as well, just because it's quite necessary for us at the moment. We've been doing a lot more VOD review, and in the following days, hopefully the boot camp will get us uh, ready for the game. It is working so far, but this week is really when we're gonna have to put it in and sort of improve the most to beat Legacy, because they are top contender. Legacy and Sin definitely underrate us. They're looking past us because in the, in the past semis, they've just beaten us in the semis quite convincingly. Barely everyone's back alive. Legacy, they are going to finish it. They'll force their day with the Chiefs in the final 3-1 over Direwolves. I, I mean, I can see why they're looking past us, but I think they really shouldn't this time around. I think Chiefs know that, like, while we've had our, had our down points, that we're still, you know, a contender. And, you know, they're willing to practice against us because they think that our practice is good enough to beat Legacy in the final. And like, I know how much Chiefs really want to beat Legacy, so if, if we could, it'd be pretty funny if we could beat Legacy um, and then even stop that from happening. If we can get it together, even just slightly, just if we can just bump up our game that, that little bit, I think we'll be in a really good spot to beat Legacy, I think. Wow, that was almost a somber Sybil there. Very, very focused on what is a big matchup to come up ahead. They're right, it is an uphill battle, but if any team can do it, it has to be the Diablos. They've done it before, to be honest. I don't know why they're that down on themselves. They beat Legacy in a semi-final. Yes, they got beaten in split too to force that final versus the Chiefs, but like they know it's possible. They've already had a good run. I think Legacy's been their Achilles heel in a lot of situations this season, but the Dials are a team, we always talk about it. When they're hungry, they definitely want to feed. And we also have to come into Not this in the with, the ex <laughs> <laughs> with the expectations that both of these teams will be playing at their top peak performance. They talked about their boot camp uh, in the video. And it's like going into this Direwolves, Legacy, both of them are very momentum-based teams, but we have to expect that this is going to be the excellent version of both of them. Well, let's actually check out the excellent version of this team. Starting in the top lane, it is going to be Sharp, the member that they spoke about, you know, now stepping up his game, looking to put a lot more in, but has maybe been the exploitable link on the lineup. Yeah, Sharp kind of had a very up and down trajectory as a top laner. He started off, you know, not great, learning the role in a lot of different ways, playing comfort picks like his mages from mid. He's gotten a lot better, and then I think dipped a little bit down. I think in general, the big reset for the dials here, Sharp, if he's got the practice and put the work in, you have to think he has before the tournament, he's actually looking pretty strong. Yeah, no, I agree with it. I definitely think uh, the issue, though, is still going to be kind of the consistency with Sharp, mm. but uh, he's got Sybil behind him. And speaking of, like, consistency, if Sybil's on his champions, looks phenomenal. I was about to say, Sybil is like, I was. I always say that he can't play the same champion twice in a row. <laughs> like, he's got, like, the biggest champion pull I've ever seen in as a jungler. It's he's just played random. Shen, for crying out loud. Yeah, he's uh, an interesting player. Definitely very gank heavy once again, similar to Carbon. I think he's, like... Excellent picks he's shown he's really good on, but he does have a lot of other junglers that he's still really good on as well. Yeah, and of course, Fantix, the perfect mid laner for his team on your screen right now. We did IG check him, ladies and gentlemen. Definitely over a. Uh, <laughs> but th this is the, really the carry for the team that we look to step up in moments like this. And I mentioned the 3-1 that they had in uh, the last semi-final at Split 1 last year. There was definitely some Fantix action happening in the top lane that time around. He's shown up big on land. He can do it here as well. Super mechanical. 
talented player, very high ceiling. He's the guy to watch. Yeah, he certainly is. Another man to watch, however, is our rookie of the split, Rays. The new AD carry taking King's spot. Now wants to take his spot in the finals as well. <laughs> Rays, formerly known as Zeratul, big Ezreal player, big Kalen player, but this guy's gone bonkers. I think he's took, taken his aggression from last year as well, to be honest. Rays and King feel like very similar players, at least as where they were last year. Rays, we know how good he can be. This is a real test for the young boy. And he's lane. got a very good support behind him in Kuden. I think criminally underrated, especially by Egypt. Shout out to Bryce Paul, but <laughs> this is <laughs> uh, he, he's shown up to be a huge support at the moment. No, I completely agree. I think the bottom lane for Direwolves, like it, again, if we're talking about mismatch, Legacy are weighted on the top side of the map. Direwolves, I think, are weighted on the bottom side. All yeah. right, so this is where I want to kick it off, right, guys? So when we look at these teams together, is it the battle of top versus bottom? Is there anything more to it? It looks very similar in the way these teams play. Uh, I would say that as always, mid and jungle is going to play a massive role in the game, but an exceptionally big one. Choose and Carbon, they've been a pair forever. We know how good Fantix is. We know how good Sybil is when he can snowball. Like th That's the core of both of these teams. And if there's any sort of mismatch there or something starts going wrong, the games could degenerate very quickly. The biggest thing for me is stylistically, both of these teams are going to be fighting teams. But I feel like Legacy has an edge on a 5v5 fight where their coordination is beyond belief. Whereas Dire Wolves are a skirmish heavy team. They actually don't have the cleanest 5v5, but Carbon did say in the video, you know, if they get ahead, they snowball ahead. Yeah, and I think that's sort of the other thing there as well, in that I absolutely agree. Like, whenever they get ahead, they're such a scary team. Yes, they've shown they can fight from behind before, but just don't give this team a lead. You know what they do with it. All right, so it sounds like right now, whoever plays better on the get day is going to win this one, which Surprise. is not really much of a prediction. So I'm going to put you guys on the spot. Frost Green starting down that end of the desk, who's going to actually win today and why? Do you want me to give score as well? Yeah. Okay. I actually think it's going to be Legacy, and I predicted a 3-0. Wow. Why? Because mm, I think, again, stylistically, these two teams, they both team fight, and I think Legacy just have the superior skirmish as well as the superior 5v5. And I think unless they just make a drastic mistake where things snowball far too out of control, they prove it during the regular season, they're the favored team going in. I have to give it to Legacy. Well, well I think they'll take... I actually slightly disagree. I think Dialves have the ability to but take But the thing is, you'll be few, like, oh, they'll take a game, games. but exactly. Legacy will exactly. win. Exactly. <laughs> I think... Yeah, I, and that's exactly what I think. Legacy 3-1 for me. Thanks, Frosco, for calling me out. Uh, <laughs> I think Dialves always have the ability to take a game. I just don't think they're consistent enough yet, at least from what we've seen, to be able to take three in a best of five. That's a tough ask. Well, I believe every dog will have its day. And, you know, wolves and dogs, they're quite close to each other. So I actually think that Direwolves will take it. I think it will be a best of five. I think we're going to get a couple of very close games this week. But I think the Direwolves can prove that they are good enough to make themselves another date with the Chiefs or Sin in the finals. However, guys, that is enough from us on the analyst desk here. So let's throw it over to our shoutcasters to take us into game one. Thank you very much, Spawn. I am, of course, Atlas. This is Rusty. This is Fish. My face will start working, don't worry, because we've got a semi-final to get into. So excited to get into these games. And, of course, Dials versus Legacy. Do you guys agree with the desk? Do you think it's a little bit Legacy favored here? I'll start with you, Rusty. I'm uh, not inclined to make predictions as I am a caster, <laughs> not an analyst. Yeah, I just really I'm like trying, trying to, to get you to... Yeah, um, you can keep trying. It's not yeah, going to happen. Do it every single time. I do How think about we you, Fish? Five games, though. Can I get anything out of you? Uh, I would give you my prediction, but I'm just going to go with the Magic 8-Ball told me, which is Legacy going to win, apparently. Really? Are they going to win like 7-5 or something like that? 26-4, I think. Oh, wow. The eight ball's really mixing it up. But of course, what the desk has already mentioned here is some really, really good points about sort of top heavy versus bottom heavy as yeah. we hop into champ select. And we'll see exactly who's going to come out on top when it all uh, washes out. And Graves is going to be the first ban here from Legacy. Yeah, so to aid to that point a little bit further, we're looking at Tally trying to really get ahead for his team and continue to snowball top lane away from Sharp, whereas on the flip side, Direwolves, they need Raze and Kuden to get going to make King and Regret have a, let's just say, a very rough time in that bottom lane and do the converse for Direwolves. We'll, we'll see whether they can as Gangplank is going to be banned away by the Direwolves. Poppy and Corky have already left the rift. Definitely some big names still on the board. Callista's coming to mind, things like that. Direwolves are going to take away the trundle. Lulu's up, guys. Yeah, Lulu's available. Lissandra as well as the other flex that Legacy have always got amongst them. I think Graves in particular, if we're looking at the bands, is the standout confusing one. Because sure, Carbon can play it. It definitely means that it's a flex with Tally as well, playing Graves in two lanes. It gives them a lot of versatility with their drafting. And to me, that looks like what Direwolves are attacking, a lot of their versatility. Exactly that. They did take Corky away as... Uh, sorry, Legacy did take Corky away as well. So that's a 
Big Bang coming towards Fantix. Strong champion, but Fantix has played that quite a lot this split. Mm -hmm. And Braum's going to be the final ban from Legacy too, yeah. so take away uh, that powerhouse support. Braum is an interesting one. So Kuden actually has a preference towards the Braum opposed to Alistar when the tanky champions of the two dynamic duo supports are available. It could mean that by banning Braum, they preference Alistar with the first pick, but with all of the junglers still available, who knows what direction they'll go. Is Nidalee the standout? Perhaps Kindred instead. Well, Raze also plays a pretty fantastic Callista as well, which is available, but Siva, another champion that has definitely been skyrocketing into popularity. It is going to be locked away, and Raze, that's actually, it feels like a pick away from King if we're going back into the history books. Yeah, skyrocketing in favor, it absolutely is, but yes, King, the Siva player essentially of the OPR right now, he jumped on that bandwagon Oof. quick, Whoa. and there's the quick response. Yeah, I was going to say, speaking of quick, the Alistair, the Gragas, both locked in instantly by Legacy. Alistar, again, Braum being banned, Alistar being picked up is a smart decision here. So Legacy's AD carry doesn't need to be as important, but Sivir's also got the ability to spell shield the entire Alistar combo, which means you have to get creative if you were Legacy. I honestly thought that one of these two picks from Legacy would have been Direwolf's first pick, but the Sivir pickup still a very, very strong AD carry. We'd like to see what they round out with their next two picks as well. Nidalee still available. Kindred, if they want to play that champion, but we haven't seen too much of that Sybil's just yet. Sybil's Elise. Yeah, it's yeah. up as well. I mean, I don't think he really cares about the jungle pool right now just because it hasn't been touched. And Sybil, we know, has when he's on comfort, which there is quite a lot of. Spawn alluded to it on the desk. He's very, very comfortable. So Dylos may just finish their bot lane here and pick the potential top laner with it so that they don't reveal too much with their strategy. Or well, they could just reveal a lot with one hit, who knows? Whoa, okay. I like it. I think Karma, if that is a support, is ridiculously oppressive with a Sivir. That is a very fast team as well. They all want to run quick. That is very true. Choo Choo's though, gonna waste no time. Locks in the Azir. Maybe expecting that Lulu in the mid lane? We know that Fantix, mm. of course, plays a few things. And King, he's going to get the Callista. That is a terrifying bottom lane. I will say, it's not usually Fantix that is the Lulu player, of course. Entirely that's, capable that's the and thing, a right? very strong Lulu player. But Sharp is usually the one who gets the brunt of, I guess, like you have to have the Lulu or the team has to have the Lulu. You just take it. Always possible that they flex it. Legacy have got some strong powerhouse, powerhouse picks in this draft so far. All these champions can be first picked in the current matter. Maybe not Azir too much, but strong champion pickups, and it looks like they're leaving their final pickup for Tally up in the top lane. Yeah, which oh, makes a lot of sense. Standard Legacy, right? Absolutely. Give that top laner the last pick. Makes sense because they want to have the top laner win a 1v1. Basically, Legacy, they like the standard lanes. I think having the Callista as well in their second rotation on red side, Shows the preferences the Die Wolves had, but also smart drafting by Legacy. Don't need to pick it up early. <laughs> oh my goodness. Oh. Okay. Oh, Took him a while. God, so He's... excited. Thought it was going to be a Maokai jungle, but it is going to be the Kindred for Sybil. There is Maokai going to be picked up for Sharp. Of course, back to an old favorite in the tree. Just wants to tank it up there on the top side of the map and pretty safe considering the fact that they don't quite know what's heading towards that top lane. Yeah, Die Wolves in a way kicking it old school with the team comp strategy at the very least. Two of their picks, Sivir and Maokai, standouts in that regard. Lulu as well, always been relevant. His legacy have rounded it out. Yeah, Die Wolves, they Echo have so top. many ways keeping you alive. But yeah, Echo. Oh my goodness, no, it'll be Gragas top, right? In Echo jungle? Oh, yeah. Give it a second. Four. <laughs> I'm excited about either, of course, Tally. It feels like an Echo play. Yeah, it definitely me. is. So Echo in the top lane is I'm gonna well, it's obviously interesting, it's unusual yeah. to say the least, but it's got a lot of damage in the way of dealing with health. Of course you've got the three stacks much like a Vayne does. You do a lot of bonus damage. It's very hard to kill an Echo who can rush magic resistance as well. Abyssal Scepter, a very good item on the champion. It's got a lot of unique perks as well if he recalls and uses the ult back to lane if he's looking to just continue split pushing. From the looks of things, Legacy have a lot of ways to displace the Di Direwolves here. A lot of crowd control, a lot of ways to displace you, move you around in a team fight. Direwolves, on the other hand, tons of ways to just run at you and keep everybody in their team alive. AoE shield from Karma, Lulu keeping a people alive, Lambs the Spike giving you that last bit of heal as well, Maokai reducing damage. These two teams have a really, really Big strategy in their team comps. Yeah, they absolutely do. I think Legacy, though, on the flip side, they've actually met Direwolf's strength. I think they've actually combated their strength with skirmishing prowess in their champion picks as well. So Gragas, Echo, zone control champions, very strong 2v2. Azir as well, very good with the zone control. Emperor's Divide, 
pretty safe, I will say, in the mid lane if Gragas is there. Think about the distance you can cover with an explosive cask and an Emperor's Divide. They'll be under your turret in a heartbeat. I think Legacy in 2v2s in every single scenario on this map have actually matched dials and said, well, we're just going to beat you at your own game. Well, we'll see whether they're going to be able to. But ladies and gentlemen, we want to hear from you. Use that hashtag DWWIN. If you think that the Direwolves are going to be able to take this series, of course, siding with Spawn on the desk there, or use the hashtag LegacyWin if you think that Pastry Time and Frost are going to onto something with their predictions. Of course, let us know exactly what you think. Use that hashtag IMOPL as well, because, man, I'm very excited to get into this game, but I have a feeling it's all about how they play in this environment. And the man in the middle that you can see on your screen right now, if I was a Direwolves fan, I'd be very, very scared of, because him at a live event, Carbon, just terrifying. Yeah, I thought you meant choo-choo's for a second. I was like, he's not in the middle. You just double on Tundra the heck out of me. <laughs> yes, I think that Carbon is the man to look out for right now. Legacy, you said it yourself when it comes to a live event, goes above and beyond, and that's because he feels the emotions. And having a conversation with Legacy before this game as well, they were saying Carbon feels content. And that, to me, is a scary Carbon because that means yeah. he is happy and he is excited and ready to go. He's definitely experienced in the offline environment and he is a strong captain of the team as well. You could say he's been leading them to numerous victories in this split of the OPL and he looks like he's ready to get another one for his team. Yeah. Exactly. Nine and one. I mean, they haven't lost to the Direwolves as of yet this split, but of course the record in, in uh, playoffs has actually been very, very similar against these two teams That's over right. the last couple of years. So it'll be very exciting to see whether the Direwolves are going to be able to step up in the playoffs because they're going to have to. Based on their record so far and what they've actually been doing in the last few weeks of the OPL, they need to up that game. But by the sounds of things, mm. scrimming against the Chiefs a lot, that's sort of been sort of the, I guess, practice pairings that they've gone off with. The top four teams now just pairing up with whoever they're not going against in the semifinals. We'll see whether that's helped their strategic play as we move into this one. How this do you feel about it? I think we've sort of had the 2v2 when we came into mm. the top four. It's like teams that aren't playing each other, like, oh, we're going to group together yeah. and try and beat the opposition, not reveal any strategies. And just to quickly bring that back to your original point as well, Looking back historically at the playoffs between Direwolves and Legacy, and even including regular splits, I think Legacy are a total of two wins ahead, and that is only through two regular split games. So split one playoffs, 3-1 Direwolves. Split two, 3-1 Legacy. This is actually effectively a 1-1 between these teams playing each other in the semifinals, which happens every time. Certainly does. Of course, King now on the other side of the matchup, which is very, very exciting for that bottom lane because we've mentioned sort of top-heavy, bottom-heavy, but... We're calling the, the Direwolves heavy on the bottom side. King, I could imagine, would not actually like that. This man has a lot to prove now on the Rift, and we'll see whether he's going to be able to step up his game because he hasn't necessarily been as aggressive as when he was playing for the Direwolves. King is kind of like a uh, minion farmer more than he is a champion <laughs> killer, opposed to Raze on the flip side. So yes, I think the onus is a lot on Direwolves to get things done based off the play styles of the team's players. Well, speaking of getting things done, we are on to Summoner's Rift, ladies and gentlemen. Direwolves will be on our blue side as we step out. Legacy going to be taking the red. And look, the top lane matchup, one that we have already spoken about, Echo versus the Maokai. Very exciting. We'll see whether we actually get standard lanes. I mean, surprisingly, we have seen a lot of Echo in this OPL split, but not so much in the top lane, I could say, as Tally is going to be pulling that one out. But we have to see what happens between these two teams as we start off this game. So far, no tricky antics, just it looks like Legacy going to be gripping up. The first thing that I've noticed, though, is Fantix is on Lulu. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily your carry-based champion in there in the mid lane, and I want to see how he plays it, because it's been a while since we've seen him on the Lulu. And we know players that can make the Lulu seem like an assassin. Direwolves are the closest team that we have in the OPL to the LPL. And yeah. solely because what, well, what that means is they play champions like Ezreal and Lulu, but they play them like they can kill everyone on the map and outplay them 1v1. They use spells aggressively every single time. So like Lulu, as an example, has E for a shield or for damage. Choose it for damage. Just get more on them. <laughs> Hurt them. Yeah, damn right. <laughs> Help picks. Help me kill the opponent by other means. But the Keystone Masteries are now on your screen. There's nothing that really stands out to me. Anyone uh, have anything that they've noticed? No, nothing outrageous. Karma in particular, I guess, with a wind speaker's blessing from the looks of it, is a uh, curious thing. But it increases self-healing by 10%. <gasps> oh Ooh. my goodness, Tally got it. That is massive, as we did have Direwolves come through and try and deny the top Krug camp. And to add insult to injury, they don't even get the small one. Goodness, so Tally already coming up big for his team. 
Well, I mean, now. that's just coming up standard, right? <laughs> really, but <laughs> saving himself from what could have been a horrible situation. He did see Regret9 try to do the same thing by invading the jungle. Both these supports giving the junglers and the top laners a little bit of a hard time as Kuden's going to be poking around with that karma. And speaking of the early start to the game too, we have a lane spot coming into this game. Direwolves are going to be sending their AD carry and their support up into the top lane. Legacy going to have King and Regret9 down in the bottom lane as you would normally see. And they're all going to be pushing out to the turret as fast as possible as Fantix and Choo Choo's just want to fight each other back and forth. Yeah, and we spoke about the teams playing against each other, the top four in separate 2v2s. Well, the Chiefs were who Direwolves played against, and the Chiefs love a cheeky lane swap pretty much every single game. So no surprises, the Direwolves, after their practice, their boot camp before this game, have actually decided to lane swap themselves. Yeah, and I actually really like this, because we mentioned the fact that both of these sides are a little bit top and bottom heavy, so maybe avoiding that early stage of the game could actually shut up uh, shore up some of those weaknesses. And they can move into that skirmish phase that both of these teams very much like. Yep, so both teams still working on taking down the other toast. Look at this Sybil coming into the mid lane, getting an early gank of the Chuchus. He is dead! First blood will go on over to Fantix. So that was a very early rotation from Sybil. It was unexpected by Chuse to say the least, but Chuse was putting a lot of emphasis on actually killing Fantix, opposed to just staying safe in the lane. So it's a pretty easy pickup based off his positioning on the map, but Again, choose. He should have known that Sybil was topside and played towards the bottom side of his lane. Instead, easy and early first blood picked up by Fantix. Yeah, and that is very, very scary. Even if he is on the utility-based champion in the Lulu, just going to teleport back into lane. He actually has himself a rejuve bead, as well as the cup. I hope you're not asking me a question from that. I'm not going to. I haven't got the slightest... Yeah, I was, I was thinking, like, is that a Mikhail's rush? I don't even know what Mikhail's builds out of and whether that's at all relevant. No, it doesn't. <laughs> no, out of a Riju vid. Titanic Hydra Lulu, pretty standard. Um, Let's touch back in in a couple minutes, shall we? <laughs> yeah. I'm having a mind blank. Yeah. It's interesting. Maybe just wants the extra health regen. Understands that, you know, well, that after a little be, while. Like, after also, a, yeah. maybe split one of last year. Mordecai's going like two Riju beads was like the standard first buy or something on a particular champion. I'm having, you know, flashbacks, but not yeah. any good now. You, you, <laughs> so you Riju be bias. It was all about the nine potions. What? Yeah, nine health potions. That was season one. I said last. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that was when you you could only buy five fish. Oh. Yeah, so you, it would have been really hard for you to do that. But we are in a slight pause, ladies and gentlemen, as you can see. We are going to be out of it as soon as possible, but already dials with the first blood. And on Fantix as well, he's got himself a rejuve bead. We have no idea what it's for. <laughs> of course, over time, if he stays, you know, under full health, will actually be worth it. <laughs> you know, if we are going to do the maths, I'm not entirely sure how long it's going to take, but there is certainly a time where it is going to buy itself back. It's only three and a bit potions worth. I think that potentially there could be something in that. I don't know. No. I will. Yeah, damn Refillable it. potion is definitely the way to go if you're looking for something more efficient. Because yeah. you recall, you get more potions. It's more efficient by the time you recall a second time than getting potions. So, curious strategy, I will say. But most importantly, it's been a good start from Diabolus. Yeah. That being said, I mean, the lane swap was successful. Um, Tally managed to get all of the global gold and the experience there from the bottom lane turret falling down. Bounced the wave back very nicely as well. So, not going to have a freeze situation on his hands for the opposing side. And do you think this is going to be another case of, look, mid lane might be a little bit of a wash, maybe just get Choo Choo's to sit back and farm and let Tally do all of the work? Sort of. I mean, we still haven't seen the end of the laning phase yet. Uh, lane swaps in particular, there's going to be yep. more dynamic changes around the map as the lane swap continues to go on. So we're still a few minutes away from actual advancement of champions. So as an example, giving more resources to Tally than you would anyone else on the map. In this case, it would be King and Regret. And having Regret sit with Carb and roam around as a jungle support duo and place vision. Ideally, if you were Legacy, yes, that is your strategy and that's what it would be. But what it also means is that mid lane is entirely farm now because what are the chances of Choose coming into a lane against someone with a chalice at like level 3 <laughs> and killing them? Well, I'm excited to see how where Dai will take this from here as well because they started that lane swap. They got that early kill in the mid lane. 
it seems like they have a plan to go up against Legacy here, and I want to really see how they're going to continue this into the mid stage of the game. Yeah, it's a really good point. And another thing is, we saw Civil go back to base. He got himself the recurve bow, which says to me that he is looking to start that Devourer. And the other question, I guess, that we have to ask is, is Civil now just going to head into his jungle, try and put that one on farm, get to Sated as soon as possible, or continue a ganking style? Of course, it has to be a little bit different with that item. Yeah, so it still costs a lot to actually get the Devourer in the first place, and you can't actually start stacking it until which case. And being it's still the lane stop, as we mentioned earlier, there's a lot of opportunities to try and get ganks off if you were Sybil, try and continue that ball rolling for Direwolves and not just have kills yourself, actually snowball the rest of the map for you. Yeah, once he gets the Devourer, I would imagine he goes into the hard farm mode, but it's also about objective control at the moment. So do they want the Rift Herald or the Dragon first is the other big question we have to ask ourselves. And how long is it going to take him to get the Devourer? I yeah. want to see how he adapts to how the game's going to go on as well. It showed that he's already able to adapt to this lane swap. Not only did they opt not to send him top lane early with the rest of his team, instead sending him mid lane to capitalize on a gank going onto Chuchu's, which was fantastic. I think if he's able to continue adapting like that, choosing whether to gank or whether to just farm as the game goes on will really dictate how he's going to Farm, or how he's going to pattern in this jungle, so to speak. He's going to be more ganking, he's going to be more farming, and I would really like to see that from Dark too. Yeah, well, we'll see exactly what does happen. Of course, it does look like Ray's having a few problems with his computer at the moment. We are going to get them fixed as soon as possible, as you saw on your screen just then. Of course, the player's unable to actually have a conversation. As I'm hearing right now, it is a mouse problem. So just making sure that that one is going to be working A-OK. -okay. If you can't use your mouse, pretty difficult to play League of Legends, unfortunately. So we'll see exactly what is going to be resolved. But another thing I want to talk about, the combination of On the Hunt plus Mantra Mantrid E coming out of Karma. Yeah, because that is a ridiculous amount of movement speed, not to mention the Lulu as well. Mm -hmm. And we've mentioned the displacement. We've mentioned all of this ability of uh, Legacy to create a scattered teamfight environment. It might actually be really hard to stop the dials from just going... A whoop, and then straight back in again because like, they're going to go, go so fast. This is almost historically like a classic Direwolves team composition as well because the idea is skirmish. If you've caught someone out of position, you've got Maokai there. Maokai's engage is 100%, right? Like the Twisted Advance is always going to go off. Yeah. You've got a Lulu to speed boost you, you've got a Karma to speed boost you, and you've got a Sivir. So it doesn't matter which context that you're in, as long as the Maokai is there, you've caught someone out of position. Yep. Because one of those three just presses the speed button and it's like, go, Maokai, catch them. <laughs> Is someone in the forest? <laughs> in the very yes, fast running go. tree, yeah. yeah. I really want to see how they utilize the Kindred Ultimate as well coming this. Because you yeah. mentioned they have all this movement speed, they have all these ways to run around and all this displacement coming in from Legacy is going to be able to stop them from you know, staying on top of that Kindred Ultimate, staying alive and staying healthy when they're about to die. I wonder if that movement speed is going to compensate for that, allow them to get back into position if they, they also, need to. Also, I guess, like the Lulu composition, it doesn't feel like there's a lot of damage if you mm. really look at it. Karma compensates a bit in the support role for what is, I guess, Lulu lacking as the game goes on later. So that's pretty cool as well. But Kindred in particular, as you mentioned, is effectively going Devourer and hard carry in the jungle role. So you would imagine a very carry-oriented build out of this Kindred, something on the lines of Hex Drinker, Sterics Gauge, making sure there's a lot of damage there. And actually just keeping Kindred alive is a big strategy here that Diables should have. Yeah, and you can see exactly what the lineups are here on your screen. And as we can see everything laid out in front of us, I want to talk about scaling a little bit because I, I look at Karma and I think that, you know, historically has been known as a champion that can fall off the later the game goes. But you've got a Devourer, a Jungler, can generally scale very, very well. Maokai, of course, has always scaled well. Lulu, at the same time, ridiculous on that front. And we all know Sivir with the crits on the Ricochet, very, very powerful in the late game. But is that enough to get past the likes of Azir and, you know, Callista and what she can do in the later stages? I will say that the composition Diables have isn't exactly long range. And mm. that's potentially the downfall that they're going to have as they move past mid game into late game. Because Azir's scaling is also still at a long range, right? Yep. So you put down the Soldier, you push it past auto attack. It's going to be difficult for people to breach that distance and not take half of their health in damage, essentially, from what is going to be Legacy's comp. Keeping in mind, the rest of the team comp as well have got displacement and zone control absolutely everywhere. So the ideal scenario is catch one out of position, zone off the rest. You've got Echo, place down the W, have this zone of you shall not pass, essentially. And then you have Azir to do the exact same thing to keep the AD carry alive, which is very cool. I agree with Rusty. You have to really see if this movement speed coming in from Diwolf's team comp is enough to compensate for that low range. 
and the fact that there's so much displacement coming from Legacy that can just bump you all around the rift. Yeah, and it also makes me think that a lot of this is going to be on the back of Choo Choo's because what you're talking about is the fact that you need to try and make sure you cut off zones and areas. And Legacy, yeah. they have the best choke point fighting team that we've seen in a long time. Of course, the Chiefs made it work, even if... Uh, Swiffer didn't quite manage to get all of his Sand Soldiers in the right positions. When he did hit that ultimate, <laughs> and we managed to actually see Radia just very, very long way away using the Jin, making sure that he can utilize that range, was able to make it work very, very well. And we'll see whether it is going to be Choo Choo's being able to operate this Azir in exactly the same way. And we've seen it already in the OPL, and he was very impressive. Yeah, absolutely was. And I guess all of these questions, not too far away from being answered now. We just need to get through the lane swap faster. Yeah, of course. The pause now done, ladies and gentlemen, as we are going to get back into the game. 600 gold is the lead here for the Dire Wolves. And Sybil going to find his way towards the bottom side of the map, adding a fair bit of turret damage now with that recurve bow. Both these two teams still opting to swap out the lanes. They already took down the top out of turret for the Dire Wolves. Now they're going back down into the bottom lane, trying to take the bottom lane out of turret. And it's still incredibly isolated in the mid lane between Choo Choo's and Fantix. Bottom lane tower will finally go down for the Dire Wolves as the four man push is still going to keep moving up towards that inner turret. Legacy, they're still working on this one. Yeah, Legacy actually a little bit late to the party. And it is going to be the Dire Wolves continuing to push up. This inner turret may actually take some. As we do see the bottom lane recalling, Alistair's going to move towards the bottom lane and we'll see whether Regret can get there in time as King and Carbon are going to be able to pick up the gold for that turret and the Callista going to continue pushing. But this is already below half health with a big minion wave. Yeah, they're actually really slow here, Legacy, and they put a lot of time in making sure the top turret fell, which means essentially all they'll get in their respective top lane is the tower to reset minions. They're actually behind a whole turret. They're behind a whole turret and about 1,500 gold right now. The lane swap is really paying off for the Dire Wolves. They have a kill, they have three turrets, which is one more than Legacy right now. And this is the ridiculous thing. This is Dire Wolves in a lane swap scenario. The team that we talk about wanting to skirmish, thriving in chaos, all of this, these sort of things have been thrown around about this side, but this has been all about strategic play and map movement from the team. Well, to me, this is just their preparation coming into the best of five. It was yeah, all right. about controlling that chaos instead of actually just breaking it out randomly. Save it. If that's where the team excels, get ahead through smart macro play. Legacy have been definitely starting to falter in that respect coming into this playoff series. Well, we do have a tweet in from Ivy. Kuden, body them, Kuden. Justify my karma love. Hashtag IMOPL. Thanks very much, can, Ivy. Can karma body people? Damn right she can. <laughs> have you seen a karma? Yeah. They body everyone. I was actually watching <laughs> Rusty play karma today, and uh, I was very scared. Yeah, it's the only, it's the only time you don't feel bad watching someone uh, play Karma in the top lane is when they're playing against a Darius, what? which is worse to deal with. Watching Rusty play anyone is actually kind of scary. Have you seen his AP Lucian? I certainly have. We've mentioned that one on broadcast. Good times. As Sharp is going to take Damn himself right to Rift is. Herald <laughs> and move towards the top lane. Actually going to get eat up by Kudan as Regret, actually waiting in the brush, decides instead just to vacate. And Legacy going to move back underneath their inner turret. Yeah, Carbon giving them the trophy. Of course, this is a sign that Legacy are trying to thwart any further advances the Dire Wolves are going to make. Of course, they're going to be down a member. Tally, he'll have to teleport in. But Dire Wolves with a Rift Herald and with the numbers advantage, looking strong here on this second turret. That's yeah. right, four and three. And this turret's already down to half health. In fact, using the Smite to try and clear as many minutes as possible, that Rift Herald is going to make them attack faster, but not as tanky as the barren up minions that you would see later in the game. They just chip it down to about half health. Tally is still in that bottom lane, but Dire Wall still continuing to push on. Yeah, so this push is smart because Tally's kind of freezing it, and he can't stay there for long. If he continues to freeze that wave, then Dire Wolves will break the second turret. They'll find themselves two ahead, and all that Legacy actually get from this is a farm advantage for the Echo, which, to be fair, is quite big right now. Yeah, of course, Tally has been where they've been putting a lot of their resources, especially mm -hmm. historically, so giving him some room. Of course, scaling up, he does a lot of damage. We're not used to seeing the um, Echo on the top side of the map, but from the jungle, doesn't get nearly as much money as the top lane variety, and we'll see whether he's going to be able to get to that stage where, you know, one use of that Chrono Break, it can change a team fight if he gets it in the right position. It does a heck of a lot of damage, mm -hmm. and we'll see whether he is going to get to that point, because we're talking about, like, Froskar mentioned it on, mentioned it on the desk. This is going to be both of these sides at the best that we've seen them. And the best that we've seen Legacy was having basically a hive mind. So irrespective if they may have like fumbled a little bit of the lane swap here, falling behind a turret maybe early on, 
this is still legacy and still a team that feels like they're attached in the brain. I will say this isn't legacy at their best right now because they're not playing standard well enough. They got ganked in the middle lane. That should not yeah. have happened. And this is actually effectively, to me, Direwolves playing better than they have been most of the split through their early laning phase. I'm going to call it more Sin-esque in the way that Direwolves are playing the map more effectively. Well, and this tower is in trouble. It certainly is. Regret actually manages to get a knock up onto Sybil, but ta ta sorry, minions are going to tank up most of that damage. Barrel goes down, but that is just more damage on the turret. And Dials are just going to keep it here for as long as they can as Tally continues to try and farm and get bigger. 35 to 13. We mentioned this is a mismatch, but Sharp's on a Maokai. And it barely matters how much money he has. He'll still be a Maokai. Yeah, and they're looking for level 6 on Maokai, essentially, and then he'll be happy. I will say, though, 41 to 15's biggest. Ooh, regret. Yeah, Bates Cole's going to come in. Regret looking for the headbutt back, but Sharp! <laughs> he gets knocked. Once again, further back with the body slam, but he's going to die eventually as it's going to be picked up by Choo Choo's, evening the score, at least as far as kills. Yeah, actually headbutted into a body slam. That so was there was so funny. no escape for Sharp, to say the least. Of course, maybe not the most efficient combo, but it didn't really matter because, again, Sharp hasn't laned. He's just getting the scraps of Direwolves. Naturally, we are going to see how this happens. So, headbutt and a body slam. It's just a lot of time where King can get stacks in him to rend the heck out of him. Sharp did have that Rift Herald buff as well, so not going to be able to continue with that push up in the top lane, but did certainly get a lot of chip damage onto that turret. If we take a look back in towards the mid lane, Choo Choo's was the man that made that rotation up to make that play happen. He's still going to be farming it up. And that Rejuve Bead is finally gone from Fantix. Looks like he's decided to sell that. Yeah, I actually think he thought it was a refillable potion. I'm not <laughs> yeah. gonna lie. Like I yeah. even said that. They when look he relatively it. similar, right? I mean they're both green. Yeah. Nailed Shaped it. Like circles. <laughs> well You know what? A part of that CS advantage that Fantix had is gone. Hmm. True. The 180 kill gold of it. it. Yeah. Well, you sell it back, right? How much does it cost? So it's 90 gold, which is respectively what he Yeah, close two, enough. Two potions. So, you know, not too much. But Fantix looking to actually steal away this blue buff if he can. Gets the movement speed from the Whimsy. There oh! it is. Grabs himself a blue buff. Nicely played. The level 9 Glitter Lance. Oh, nice shoes there by Choo Choo's. So he's going to wander back to lane, but blue buffless. That could be a big deal here for the Azir. Doesn't quite get the Thunderlord's proc, but you can see definitely a lane bully. It does look like Chuchus is going to try and pick up an Abyssal Scepter as well. So the two Doran's Rings and his Biscuits are all the mana regeneration he's going to get for now. Fantix will have that blue buff to be able to shove out this lane a little bit more. Legacy looking to try and take down Dragon, it seems. Yeah, you got Fantix actually putting on a bit of pressure here in the mid lane. Of course, doesn't have the Ignite. It's a teleport for the Lulu, but they've got a ward on this Dragon. We'll see whether Sharp is going to potentially make a move. He's already down there towards the bottom side. And Sybil! Oh, tries to get in there. Doesn't actually get the hop over the wall. They don't He's know just that. going to say, uh, never mind. Um, I'll just wait it out. Does yeah. so just fine. So they get the dragon here, Legacy, which of course is big, as Devourer was completed by Sybil. So denying those stacks yeah. from the Diwolves jungler. We'll be happy about that if you were Legacy. And once again, Diwolves showing aggression. That's right. There are three members in the mid lane trying to push for this mid lane outer turret. Legacy immediately throw three of their own men into that mid lane to defend that. Lots of chip damage down into this turret. As Raze is going to stroll down from the top lane into the mid lane as well. Pick up as much farm as he possibly can. The rest of Diewolves now deciding to head back home. And I mean, we had some questions even coming into this series. Uh, Fantix is a mid laner. He lost lane to Rymeister, which not to call Rymeister a bad mid laner. It's more to say that Fantix doesn't lose lane. No, but not to anyone. Did. And that is the rarest thing that you'll ever see in OPL, has come back after his couple of days off and displayed that he is the mid laner that we look towards to call him what used to be perfection. And that's exactly right. Of course, I notably called him one of the best players in the OPL. I believe my exact words were best in player trouble. in the OPL. Just didn't quite work out in that particular series, and we'll see whether he's going to be able to prove it now. As Carbon's going to get slowed down by Qden, snared up too, potentially, but Body Slam gets him to safety. Raze thinks that he can spell shield and auto attack, but unable to. Because he's now very low. Sand Soldier's in amongst it, doing some work as Tally's looking to actually get in there, uses the dash. But in the end, the movement speed is going to prove too strong and the dial will disengage nicely. And minding that this is also a tank echo, of course, has the Barmy Cinder as his first item. I would imagine goes the 40% CDR route on this echo with the Frozen Fist and Spirit Visage. 
Well, we'll, have no to surprises. we'll have to check back in with the items later and see what he decides to pick up. But Legacy now, they're the ones that are trying to turn this push around. Looking to try and chip down this mid lane turret as much as possible as everybody on the, in this game is grouped up in the mid lane and pushing. Minions on both sides pushing for the side of Legacy, though. Yeah, of course, Legacy with a lot of minion control, meaning that they can set up for this siege. You can see five members strong still hanging around. Fantix with a fair bit of, I guess, wave clear. Should be able to deal with this as Civ is going to move back towards the mid lane, but Glitterlands not going to quite be enough, and this turret is going down very low. Tally just going to get out of there. And the Direwolves are at least going to keep their turret alive. Yeah, Direwolves holding on for now, but Legacy also sh showing some signs of aggression, I guess, back in the opposite direction. Still down a turret, so they've got options available to them. Question is when will they start to attack them? They're still putting a lot of pressure down into this mid lane. The only person that's not there for Legacy right now is Carbon, which is hiding behind his turret for now. Diewolves eventually do need to react to these side lanes that are pushing in. They do send Sharp down into the bottom lane. Does have his teleport available to join the team at any time. In fact, Diewolves have both their teleports up. One being on Sharp, one being on Fantix. But the top laner for Legacy, Tally, has headed up into the top lane. Going to continue that push for himself. Meanwhile, the fact that Legacy did have to send Carbon home, unable to really utilize having Sharp move towards the bottom side, and Dials are going to be able to clear up their side lanes quite nicely. We'll see now that Carbon has made his way back, whether they're going to get enough damage down. But Cuden, there with the empowered Q, he's going to at least save the turret, but I mean, it's on a sliver of health. It's a slow battle between these teams right now in regards to the middle lane. They've chipped away each other's turrets, but numbers advantages starting to form for Legacy, which is why you can see all of Direwolves have now hard grouped up. Of course, trying to stack the Devourer actually provides small advantages to Legacy if they keep their jungle amid, pressure down objectives and get the team gold, whereas Sybil needs to be at least a little bit selfish with stacking the Devourer up and doing some jungle camp. So, interesting distribution of their efforts. Yeah, Ray's also about to get that 350 gold from his cull that he managed to pick up earlier on. Also has a CS advantage. So despite the added assist for King, will probably be ahead by a fair bit as far as that gold is concerned for the Sivir. And is definitely important. Of course, you want to hit those, those three items if you can and we'll see whether he can get to it in time. Not just Sivir that's ahead in gold. Dai will still lead in terms of gold against Legacy. Still 2,000 gold ahead of this team. They don't have a single dragon yet, which has gone on over to Legacy, but are still a single turret ahead. Legacy have been really trying to take down the mid lane outer turret first and to equalize that one back up. But their mid lane outer turret of their own is pretty low as well. And speaking of mid lane, hot tip, Azir maxes W first. A uh, second rather, opposed to the E, which I know doesn't make a lot of sense because the E does damage when you hit people. It gives you a shield as well. It'll reduce the cooldown, I believe, but when you're not building cooldown reduction, you need more soldiers as Whoa, Sybil. there's the flash. Pulverizes Regret getting right in there's amongst it. Sybil, tally. yeah, it's going to jump straight into a stun potentially as he does actually manage to get some vision over the wall and might be turning this one around. We'll see. Tally is going to get polymorphed. Not going to be found by the Glitterlands, though, and Diawals with some sneaky plays, but not going to find too much. Yeah, oh, wow. Raze, though. He's going to get shielded up and sped. By Cuden and really nice patience there on the ultimate as the boomerang's going to fly through. Carbon takes a lot of damage, especially now with only that jungle item there. Ray's biting back, I will say, though. Positionally, positionally, Legacy are looking to get these out of uh, inner turrets in the bottom lane, which means mid is actually running a risk of going down. They're doing a really good job of trying to get it, but look at this. Regret 9 now trying to jump in on towards the rest of Diewolves. Teleport is going to be coming back in from Tally. Cancelled. Actually cancels that one out. Still pushing in the bottom lane. He will be able to get this out of turret. Yeah. Flash had to be used there by Sharp, though. He used his Twisted Advance and then sort of... There was an invisible cow after the Fates call. But Tally successful in gathering that turret. Now very low Part on mana as Yeah, him, he's yeah. actually looking for more here as the Wild Growth silly. is going to be used. Another slow comes down. But he is going to get oh, out wow, of there. Explosive him. cast comes in. Sharp once again going to be taken down. And the Sun Turret, it's going to help out. Choose, despite giving up first blood, has picked up every kill for Legacy, which is two. Which means, of course, Legacy, they broke the mid lane turret of Direwolves. They also broke the bottom lane turret and Tally lived. They are now one turret up themselves, but still down a fair bit of gold. As, of course, the second it went down, Sharp overstayed his welcome. Carbon, easy pickup and well done as Hello. 
Civil. Yep, Civil once again jumping over, but King with the rend. Wanted to be able to use it, but not going to happen. It wasn't yeah. going to kill him. No. Legacy were able to even that up for just a split second, it seemed. That play on the bottom side of the map and in the mid lane got them an even gold lead, but Die will still pick up another turret for themselves. Both the inner and outer turrets in the top and bottom lanes are now down for the Die Wolves. So they have four turrets. Legacy equaled it up with the mid lane outer turret as well. And they do have two dragons to their name. So a really close game between these two teams. And the cycle of the mid lane with wave clear continues. They will push Thanks, and they analysis. won't get anywhere. Yeah, that's what he says, right? Yeah. Naturally, of course, Azir and Lulu being both of the mid laners, you'd think that no turret would fall down. This comes down to timing your pressure when you think you can be there. And when Legacy are pushing advantages, knowing that someone has gone to answer tally. So it comes a lot down to having vision. I think most importantly speaking, of Diawals have a lot of it to try and take this turret in response. Yep, they are going to be able to do so as well. The outer is going to fall. Diawals pick that one up relatively easily. His legacy were caught shopping. That being said, it is a Nash's Tooth that was picked up by Choo Choo's. Blade of the Ruin King now there for King. Building towards that hurricane now with the Swiftness Boots already there. And you can see it's a lot of items already for Tally. As Sybil grabs himself the stacks. No cheeky carbons going to take those away. How many marks was that? 18. What? Marks. Oh, oh, sorry. I was looking at the Devourer. I don't care about marks. <laughs> okay. You, you can check those out. It's all nah, about Devourer stacks, man. 18 marks. Like, man. That's huge. That is a big kindred if he has 18. <laughs> <laughs> He's had like seven Barons, man. That's 100 marks. He's actually doing 100% of their health in damage. Every auto attack. No problem at all. No, I'm not sure. We will have to check back in. Yeah. I think also the two kills that Chu's got, by the way, has evened out this mid lane. So... The effective roaming, I'll say, of Legacy and once again playing back to their team composition, which has a lot of strong displacement and skirmishing strength, yeah. has given time for Choose to wave clear mid even when he was behind and rotate top, which got him that first kill, evens out mid lane, and then he picks up an easy second one. Yeah, it's nicely done as Mora Melmordius is being built up now by Sybil. As we look over, Carbon already has that Aegis of the Legion. We'll see whether that is going to be Locket of the Iron Solari or whether he's going to head towards the Banner of Command, which would be a little bit exciting. Damn. Wow, what were you excited about there? I was hoping Tally was going to steal the Krugs because there was a civil farming one there. <laughs> would have been twice this game so far. I know. Did that? If only. Tally the Krug killer. Well, <laughs> you can see Legacy actually positioning themselves on the top side of the map, looking at that last remaining inner turret on a side lane. Try and pick themselves up some extra gold. Nice clearing of vision as Carbon is looking to steal away this blue buff. And you'd think with four people here, they are going to do so oh, quite wow. easily. Sybil is going to get caught. There's another headbutt back as Regret really making some plays. The ultimate goes down, but Sybil has to flash back onto it. Shields for days, but King eventually picks it up with the rend. What a skill to have after Lambs Respite is now Fantasy Fantasy's to Tally. They're going at it. They definitely are. Shields in, the in there, but my gosh, is he tanky. Tally now with so much magic resist already, just spamming out these abilities under no the tally. turret still. Wow. He's trying to get it done, but not going to happen. And Fantic's going to survive, but it's one pick there for Legacy. So early escape from Tally, I will say, was very smart because pushing your luck against the Lulu is the number one no-no of League of Legends. <laughs> Sharp once again taking some deeps. Quite a lot of damage coming out from Legacy now, but they're not going to focus too much on this tree. Instead, trying to push out to take down the turret. My goodness, Tally being really aggressive down in that bottom lane. As Choo Choo's still looking for the turret. So the game's accelerated a bit on Legacy's side. They have knowledge right now. Fantix doesn't have his ult, doesn't have flash. All they know is he has teleport. And at the moment, based off the track record of the past two minutes, Tally can kill Fantix, so he won't be split pushing which means you can actually assume that Diables will be grouping with him as four members and having sharp split. So opportunities, I will say, for Legacy, knowing that they have the advantage with summoner spells to catch people out. Yeah, Fantix, of course, just finishing off that Lich Bane, so it might be a little bit better off, but we'll see what he can actually do as Tally very close to the Spirit Visage. A bunch of extra items for him. But, I mean, I'm looking at Choo Choo's. I mean, he's got a needlessly large rod as well as his two core items now. We'll get very, very close to being at that sort of three-item form as Azir with that Rylai's pro coming probably second up. Yeah. And we spoke about the bottom lane of Legacy as well. Effectively neutralizing the difference between these two is a win for Legacy because that also means mid is keeping up and that's always expected of both Chu's and Perfection who have been performing well this entire split, especially coming into this. The top lane is still the major discrepancy that we have to talk about. That's right. 50 CS up on Tally right now and two deaths on Sharp. 
which does mean he is at an experienced disadvantage. Tally has two levels on him 22 minutes into this game. He has the items to boot too. Iceborne Gauntlet picked up, like Atlas mentioned, looking for that Spirit Visage. He has the Barmy Cinder too. So he's a huge echo. Yeah, and the best thing is he wasn't 1v1-ing. Like, he was never in a situation. Sharp has never been in a situation where he's going to fight Tally. They've just straight up played the map, essentially, with their top lane or top half of the map. And gotten who they want to be ahead, miles ahead. Yeah, this is the thing. It's delegation of resources right out of Legacy because they've managed to even out the mid lane. That's 10 CS. Means about nothing right now is Carbon. Going to body, body slam himself pretty aggressively onto the enemy side of the map. But look, you've even managed to even, even out King. King. King is now ahead by eight farm on this Callista. One, zero, and two. Hit that two item power spike with the Renan's Hurricane and he's looking very, very strong. And Choo Choo's. Actually had to burn his flash there in the middle lane as Legacy aren't looking to try and take down this dragon. It would be the third dragon of the game and the third dragon for Legacy as well. And this is going to go uncontested once again. Legacy able to control that dragon pit really effectively in this game. Yeah, not only do they have three dragons, once again they've denied the stacks from Sybil. Yeah, I and think that that's is the big just, deal. Yeah, that's the other massive thing. Of course, three dragons and 24 minutes puts you well and truly on track towards the next one being at least a team fight or at least a big emphasis from the Direwolves, so a predictable strategy in the next, well, in six minutes from now. But that's that's starting on the right page and then some as a teleport from Sharp. Yeah, but Legacy are going to oh, disengage effectively. That's a massive glitter lance across three members, but Legacy able to get out. That I'm just going to reposition. Though. Yeah, exactly. That also means that Tally has a lot of free time up in the side lane once again. He's still split pushing in the top lane. It's going to be Fantix that meets him there, puts down the Glitterlast, trying to slow him down. Thunderlords will proc as well as Sharp. The big scary tree just running at him. But with all that pressure, Legacy are able to just take the mid lane turret for free. It's now 5-5 five to five on turrets. Send more than one person to the side lane. Tally's going to call it out. You're going to get free objectives. Azir, very good at taking down turrets. And it almost looks like Direwolves had a fantastic early macro game moving over and around the map. And now it's Legacy pivoting on Tally, so to speak, taking all these turrets. Well, you can see Cuden actually going to stop Carbon's back here as he body slams his way to safety. Direwolves trying to take control of their own jungle. I love those red lights to show them with the sweepers. Yeah, no, it's real cool. It's great. It's like red strobes. But Direwolves actually think that they might have something here. Just going to try and... grab themselves this Rift Scuttler Sybil with some well-earned Devourer stacks. 29. Yep, one more, and he will have that little puppy turned into a new one. Of course, I love Straight Devourer and oh, It just makes so much sense. Well, wolf of has Lamb another wolf, wolf yeah. yeah. Unfortunately, one of them disappears at 30 stacks, so rest in peace to his current wolf. The more jealous one? One remaining. Yeah, but you know, it's like he absorbs the wolf. She absorbs the wolf, sorry, you know? And it becomes wolf and wolf. Yeah, and but then due to the fact that, you know, you get extra auto attacks, feels like the wolf trying to escape. I don't know. Okay. Uh, I feel like thematically it makes sense. Quickly bring it back to something yeah, that let's I do, do that. want to discuss, though, is Carbon's build path. All right, do that. So he's got Banner of Command. He's just completed it. He's just Love used it. it on a minion. And that, to me, is like... Again, I said this at the start of the game, and I will continue to reiterate the fact. Legacy are trying to beat Direwolves essentially at their own game. So early game, they actually got out-rotated entirely, and they struggled. They fell behind a bit of gold, and then they just started to... Pressure them out with vision, do some more skirmishing style of play, and make small advantages. Of course, the aim of the game for Legacy right now is have numbers advantages by forcing people into side lanes. If Fantix is with Tally, oh, hang on. Yeah, Dial's actually looking for an engagement here, but the E's going to be used to get the Azir to safety. Regret might be slowed down, but just uses the ultimate in order to keep himself safe. And that is ultimate's traded Siva for Alistair. And once again, this comes back to Lulu having to be in the bottom lane. So Tally can cancel his teleport, and Tally's also going to be applying a lot of pressure. What this also means is that the two split pushes of Direwolves are magic damage. So how are they meant to kill a Banner of Command Cannon? Look at the deeps. Well, look at this. Tally doesn't care about this turret. He wants to take down Fantix, forces him to pop his ultimate as well. 
Wild Growth has been used, and Tally's still going to continue to work on this turret. Can't stand on displacement field to try and deter Fantix from continuing coming. the aggression. Well, you're right, Kindred is rotating down from the jungle. So is Gragas. that the red buff now? Gragas is right behind him, going to be able to knock him straight into the wall. Might have to pop that Lancer Spy. Tally's going to pop the ultimate, get a lot of damage down to these Die Wolves members. As Sharp is trying to flank on towards Tally, will be able to pick up a kill on him. And it's now Carbon that's in a lot of trouble as the rest of Legacy were able to take down Raze in the back lines. And now it's going to be Regret Knight jumping back in. Yep, Sharp actually going to get altered away there by Choose, but King able to take down Sybil already. Choose just walking through the Empress Divide. Sharp ca can't actually find him, and it is going to be an even trade in the end. Talion Carbon for Raze and Sybil. And at first you were looking at Legacy's target selection and kind of questioning it because they lost their top laner very early. And saying that, you have to keep in mind that Raze was the man that King was definitely looking towards. You can see even the way they walk down on the minimap is Sharp's engaged, we mentioned it. 100% guaranteed to go in. Times it well with Tally trying to get away, but all of this time spent on Kudan almost backfired. And saying that King did work and he's now 2 0 and 3. King is 2 0 and 3, and the entire legacy are 5 and 3 now. 2,000 gold ahead of Die Wolves, so completely flipped that gold lead that Die Wolves had at the start of the game. And they're looking really strong as we approach 29 minutes into the match. A minute until Dragon number four for Legacy would respawn. And you'd have to think that might be a point of contention for the Die Wolves. They might want to fight over that objective before it's a little bit too late. I'm going to Up take now? a stab here. I'm going to say it's Abyssal Scepter next item for Tally. But that to me would be like, I'm very curious if that's where he's going to go. Hmm. Because they've already got one on the team. Well, oh, Fantix going to get body slammed here. Was thinking about the auto attack and then said, no, oh, no, Calvin, you're not worth my time. He's going to move back towards the mid lane, continue clearing out these minions. Dials haven't quite found the engagement that they've been looking for. Hmm. And now Sharp behind by about Guess 80 CS as Tally's just continuing this split push. And look, it's almost as if Legacy are like, okay, you can take your cluster teamfight comp and we'll just raise you taking down all of your turrets and never grouping up. So they've actually, uh, the way that they've set up their lanes here on Legacy's side and Diwolves, I will say is accurate and correct right now, but the inside track that Legacy have essentially to what is the Dragon Pit, which is up in four seconds, is yep. noteworthy. They can catch potentially out of position here. And they're looking to try and do that with two people up in the top lane. Regret9 going to get the double knockoff onto Kudan. We'll be able to take him down. Sybil just has to watch as his helpless support gets absolutely destroyed. Meanwhile, in the top lane... Yeah, Tally actually looking to 1v2 here as he does have the parallel convergence down. Gets the slow. Looking to try and face up. There it is. Over the oh edge. My Sybil's God. here as well. He's just going to turn the aggression on. Tally <laughs> now trying to run away. It's not <laughs> enough. He's so no. fast with that passive. I dodged it. And that is going to be enough. Out of the way of the Glitter Lance and says, not even close. This is freaking Aladdin right now. That's all he's doing. Literally just ran the gauntlet of death. Every single member of Diables one at a time and gets away with no health or mana. The perfect amount. Legacy pushing bottom. Just yep. like that, they've got oh. four dragons and now they're throwing Fantix back in the team. He gets absolutely melted as they're trying to collapse on the remaining members of the Die Wolves. The ultimate's been popped by Kindred, but it might not be enough as two people have already fallen. They're looking to take down Sharp. He goes down. Tally is almost diving in towards the fountain and King. Legacy are all over the Die Wolves base. Sybil is going to go down. Wow. They're looking for the Nexus turrets. Legacy look to take game number one. Yeah, Tally, of course, teleport in, you saw Dials trying to do what they could underneath their own turrets, but it's all about the echo this game. The Nexus is going to fall. Game one for our first semi-final is going to go to Legacy. And after that start, who was expecting it? Tell you what, that just exploded out of nowhere. Ridiculous. One advantage, and once again, that was baiting the fourth dragon. Yep. Very simple. Diables make a big mistake sending five people to go top lane and actually try and take out Tally. The Miracle Escape teleports back in and ends the game with his team. And it was such a strong start from the Diables as well. They had a huge map rotation that got them so many yeah. turrets ahead. And Legacy, they just stayed calm and collected and fought back when they knew the time was right. I will say, though, most importantly, it was just the decision-making of Legacy. I think Gragas, to me, was actually the big standout difference in what separated these two teams. Kindred's not hard engage. Carbon says go. He makes sure that they go. Catches Fantix out and just, like, literally just bam, game's over. Yeah, and the Dragon Denial was fantastic there as well. Sybil never really felt like he got to grab a whole bunch of those Devourer stacks, but ridiculous first game there from Legacy. We're going to throw it back to the desk for some further breakdown.
Thank you so much, guys. What a game one performance out of both teams. Legacy in the end, able to edge it out. And it did feel like a battle of early game versus late game execution because Direwolves got that game rolling in very good fashion. So the lane swap was initiated by the, the Direwolves, which I really liked. I actually thought their composition on both sides were ra rather creative. I liked the Sivir... Uh, Lulu, Karma, everyone runs fast. Um, I expected that it would be a lane swap, not only because obviously they've been boot camping and, and trying to practice that, but um, this idea that Sivir does really well on a lane swap, Maokai does well, it just, I, it read really telegraphed. They executed it, executed it brilliantly to a point, especially when um, Carbon was delayed on rotating up with his team and they actually had a tower advantage over the bottom side. The issue is, is when Legacy decided to hold the wave on the top side, when, um, what's their name, Direwolves, had the Rift Herald and they were pressuring forward. They should have taken the tower on two wave attempts, but they tried for the third wave and that's when you had the brilliant roam from Choose because Fantix wasn't able as Lulu to be pressured forward in the lane. The fact that Fantix just didn't hold Azir down cost Direwolves majorly. And I want to talk about this because I actually think that this is a case of greed and Legacy reading it really well. Any other team dives mid lane. You yep. push the first wave, you don't get the turret, you push the second. As soon as that second wave's gone, you disappear into the jungle. If Legacy follow you, you kill them in an uneven fight. Because they're walking into Because they're walking into Fog of War. If they don't follow you, you kill the Azir because it's 5v1. Yep. Like, that is just, to me, a really greedy play from Legacy. They went for two turrets, they got none, they lost the game, and Legacy were able to execute. And you were talking about this pastry time. The idea that Legacy, if you make any, like mistake around the map, they just jump on you. Yeah, they're really good at punishing, especially when you give a player like Carbon a champion like Gragas. Like, we saw it in time and time again in that game. You were kind of just asking for things to go badly, and yes, Legacy were quite greedy with how they executed parts of the early lane swap, and they did make some mistakes and lose some ground, but this is a team that as soon as they think they have an advantage in any sort of skirmish, they'll fight you, and more often than not, they'll win. All right, and now there's a player that I actually really want to talk about because Le uh, Legacy in their interview, Choo Choo said they play a very telegraph way. They give all their resources to Fantix. Well, I've got a new shock, but I think Legacy play a very telegraph way and they give all their resources into their top laner. Tally was 100 CS by the end of that yeah. game and they froze a wave at like base turrets to get him that advantage. Is there a way to exploit this going into the next couple of games? specifically on Tally, it's just effectively yeah. looking for a counter matchup, which is weird because we, you know, we had the, the Echo pickup and we were talking about it upstairs. It's like, oh, it's a pseudo poppy. Yeah. <laughs> it, it chases really far. Does a lot of damage, it's really tanky. It's hard to, it's hard to nail down. Yeah. It farms really well, it pushes. It's annoying, yeah. CC, like it's just it's the poor man's poppy. Yeah, and um, which is weird because I think poppy was open <laughs> and they decided not to take it, but Tally, no, he did right. do no, a lot No, it was of banned by Legacy. Oh, well, that would make sense. Yeah. So there you go, that's why they need a poor man's poppy, which I guess would make sense with to Tally's credit, he did a lot with the gold. I think if you're going to shut Tally down, you probably need standard lanes. But you're always worrying. The, the worry then is that, okay, now you have to fight the carbon Tally 2v2, and I'm not sure the civil sharp 2v2s may be up to the top. And that's something that I really want to underline is, and we've talked about this before, the, the series going into this, you know, like, Legacy wants standard lanes. That's, that's how they win the game. They're very strong in it. And Direwolves, I think the best case scenario for them is to continue to lane swap. And it was so close, but just not quite there, simply on a single mistake, holding the wave too long. Well, just not I s quite there means that Legacy do take game number one. In pretty emphatic fashion in the uh, meanwhile. But we do have a couple more games coming your way, guys. So don't go anywhere. We'll be back in three and a half.